AFA's family, what's going on? It's Reggie Williams, founder and CEO of Ambrosia for Heads. And with me, I have Jake Payne, our editor in chief. And together, this is our What's the Headline podcast. Happy to be back. We took a week off last week. You know, one of the things we prided ourselves on uh, with our site is not forcing the issue, not trying to push news cycles when they're not there. Um, it often leads to thirsty, you know, behavior, chasing clicks and stuff like that. And we've always really tried to aspire to just deal in quality, quality over quantity. Last week was a pretty slow week in hip hop. Uh, this week was not that at all. Um, in fact, it's a week that people have been looking toward for, I would say, five plus years now and even more so in the last few months. Um, of course, many of you already know that DMX's final album, Exodus, was released this week. Um, and we plan to do a deep dive into that album, talk about it track by track as has become our custom here, uh, give you our thoughts about it, um, informed by a lot of research, uh, not only listening to the album, reading the lyrics, but interviews, um, everything we can kind of get our hands on to really kind of bring a different perspective to this. So we hope you enjoy it. Um, Jake Payne, how you doing, man? Man, I'm doing well. That was a beautiful intro. It's good to be back. And yeah, what a uh, probably, um, you know, for guys like you and I, I mean, I don't know how it compares, but I might venture to say biggest release day of the year so far. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, I think Cole is up there too, but this one just takes on a different significance. I think it would have been huge no matter what, just because X has been gone for so long. It's been so long since he's had a, a real album and we've been teased for a number of years. Um, but, you know, with his passing, I think it's gone to a whole different level. So, so I agree. Um, yeah, I want to start off just by just top level thoughts about the album. You know, what are your kind of first impression reactions? And again, I'll stress that you and I have not been fans of hot takes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we try and balance between being current and, and, and sharing our thoughts um, as things come, come out versus being respectful to really kind of digest the album, process it over time, because it, often it takes a little while for things to open up. So with that, you know, what's your 24 hour impression? Yeah, I'm about six or seven listens in. I mean, this is a totally different listening experience than J. Cole um, in that, you know, I would say it's more straightforward, um, similar in length, but I just have I've had it on rotation. And to me, this feels like a proper send off. There's moments on this album that I think tap into various aspects of who DMX um, was musically and was as a person. Um, you know, and, and it, it reminds me that the comparison that I'll make is, is big puns. Yeah, baby, which, uh, you and I recently, you know, spoke about, you know, posthumous albums. And I don't know that that one came up, but there were moments on that album, which released the same year that pun passed away that I thought really dialed into who Christopher Rios was. I think we get a good sense of who Earl Simmons was and, and yeah, I'm eager to, to talk about those moments, but it felt like, a send off more than a posthumous kind of surgically put together album, which we've gotten before, but that's my take. What, what was, what, what's your takeaway right now in terms of general thoughts? Yeah, man. You know, so for me, just diving in on that point about taking time to digest albums, my, my impression of the album has changed quite a bit since I first heard it. You know, my first listen, I, I, I pressed play at like 12, 10, uh, you know, last night, mm -hmm just after I checked out the Eminem song, because we were doing you know some stuff on that. And um, immediately there were four songs that kind of grabbed me. You know, um, the first song with the locks, second song with Jay and Nas, um, Hood Blues, and the joint with Snoop. So those four songs kind of struck me off the bat, right? And then I went back this morning and started listening to things. And um, a couple more songs opened up. But then I started really digging in to the lyrics, listening to Swiss talk about the album, how it came together, the significance of certain pairings and, and the way that the album was approached and other things started to really open up. And I gotta say like, as of now, like, um, you know, his song about his son, his first son, yeah, that one might be my, my favorite song on the album. And it didn't even speak to me the first time I listened to it. You know, partly I, I was skimming, um, you know, I wasn't listening intently to the lyrics but that one is just so heavy. So, you know, I can't wait to get into it track by track, but 
just to say that my whole impression of it has changed even in like, you know, 14 hours or so uh, since it dropped. I agree with you. And it's so interesting, that whole midnight phenomenon. I mean, you and I both, you know, we're, we've been all over the world over the last year, you know, in terms of, or at least by coastal, but, um, you know, for the time being right now, you and I are both on the East coast. And it's so interesting on one hand, I've had a lot of memories over the last two or three years of this whole like midnight on Friday, boom, listen to something. But I don't know that an album like Exodus, that phenomenon does it justice. Um, because when I listened last night, my impressions today are a bit more evolved from that. And after you've had a crazy day or you've, you know, been up or, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're kind of winding yourself down to listen to an album from an artist like DMX at midnight, your expectations might be different than they are in the morning or than they are after a weekend of listen. So I, I just think it's an interesting place of where we are with music consumption because, you know, even the um, Griselda single came out in the middle of the day a few days ago and and that to me like the first moment i heard it i'm like damn i love this this is what i was waiting for and you just wonder how that works with psychology and timing and all of that yeah i mean to your point for me i've always gotten to the point where the first listen just doesn't even count because mm. the first listen it for me at least is filled with expectations right like i have a very distinct thought about what i think it should sound like and you know, if it meets that, then great. If it doesn't meet it, then it's a disappointment, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not good. It just means that it didn't meet what I thought it should be the first time around. So uh, the second time is when I start to go on with more of a clean slate and accept the album for what it is instead of what I wanted it to be. And that's when it starts to build for me. That's a really good point. So, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to unpack here, even before you press play. So, you know, what are some key things for you in terms of the context leading up to Exodus that, that, that you or I or the listeners should know when they hit play, besides obviously that, you know, here we are less than two months removed from Exodus passing. Yeah, I mean, so you and I talked a couple of weeks ago about this being a posthumous album and we had a back and forth. You know, you were of the mindset that it wasn't really a posthumous album uh, because it was recorded prior to his passing. And I was taking a very technical, you know, literal um, definition of it. I think I'm, I'm, I'm coming around more to, to your approach of it, you know, uh, because Swizz has been talking about this album since 2016. You know, he was very, very hype about it. I think in April 2016, he started a, a radio run that um, was about a year long and had like, I think, five or so interviews, most of which we covered talking about what to expect and how excited he was and how DMX was clean and, and sober and refreshed and, and rejuvenated and that this was X, you know, at his finest. And so that brought a lot of weight with it, um, you know, and then obviously it didn't materialize for many, many more years. But then, you know, I'd say five, six months ago, probably kicking off with his uh, interview with Kwali on People's Party, he started, X himself started talking about the album. And that was my first uh, recollection of him talking about it. Then, of course, on Drink Champs in February. So, so I started getting excited, man. Um, one of the things that really um, excited me is the, the, the types of features that he had, because he was very, um, very intentional about getting features both from current artists, but also artists of his era. And to me, that showed that he was evolving and you know, looking to kind of stay current with the times. So I was curious to hear how that was going to go. You know, the pop smoke one really um, intrigued me because that wasn't a pairing that I would have anticipated because their musical styles are just so very different, despite the fact that they got gravelly, um, growly voices. You know, and they both represent hardcore New York. You know, yeah. both of them kind of. I know, I know the like bring New York back is such a cliche that I don't agree with, but in '98, '97, and in you know 2018, 2019, 2020. Both of these guys, you know, reemerge with a aesthetic that I think New York needed. We can all agree on that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Pop Smoke though having kind of a drill music sound, and, and X, um, I wouldn't even call it boom bap because what he and Swizz did was different than boom bap. Like it was like the next era, but you know, whatever, however you would define that. But you know, getting back to the posthumous point, like the fact that this album was created over that span of time. And, um, you know, Swiss has been very, very vocal about it being very much X's vision, you know, in collaboration with him. He produced most of the tracks, if not all the tracks and some co-produced. 
um, it was truly a return to the way they worked in the past. And he's even said that this is the closest that he and X have, have worked on an album since Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood. So that to me says that this is, is fully DMX's vision, you know? And so um, I wouldn't necessarily call it posthumous, but what about you? No, I agree with that. And, and as we've, we've heard what, what Swizz has to say, I mean, a lot of these features were recorded over years. A lot of them, some of them recorded in the same studio. The sense that I get is that in one or two places, there were things that were tweaked after the fact, mostly due to, you know, just reuse verses or label considerations or what have you. But this is the album that DMX wanted to give people. And while he might not have had the luxury of the final, you know, finishing touch, this is this is definitely on par with that. And I, you know, Swizz has been a producer to the fullest extent of this. And, and that fact blows my mind that this is over 20 years removed from how closely they work together on Flesh of My Flesh. But what a what a beautiful send off that way to have an artist who used a lot of emerging producers in the 90s and really gave the first step for Swizz to become who he became to now have this reunion where Swizz has brought X back into the light and they get to kind of have this, this moment, you know? Yeah, and one of the things, now, so Swizz is basically doing the promo run that X would have done. Yeah. And he talks about the fact that X had a plan, you know, he was gonna get back in shape, he had gotten a little heavy. Incidentally, Swizz says he was actually um, always kind of more comp, more at peace when X was heavy, because it typically meant that he was not moving in ways that would cause him to drop weight that, that were destructive, you know? And so his death really caught him completely by surprise because he wasn't necessarily in shape and he was talking about getting to the gym and, and getting in shape, taking two months to like really, you know, um, get where he needed to be. Very excited about rolling out the album. There was nothing that indicated that something like this was gonna happen. So, um, but he's been doing this run and he's been very vocal about curating the album. You know, so apparently there are seven songs that he cut. The album is only 39 minutes long. And if you cut skits and the prayer, it's really only 10 songs, you know? Yes. So it's a very, very highly curated project, uh, lean and mean, you know? Um, but, you know, one of the things that um, I think about with this is, is whether or not um, those songs will come out or any of the other music that we've, we've kind of heard. And he says that, he doesn't think that he doesn't really feel that any more music by X should come out at this point because mm -hmm. he doesn't know that there's anything else that rises above where this album is. Mm -hmm. And, and he thinks that anything else would be a disservice to his legacy. And so not only is he being careful with it, he's actually cautioning others who have footage, who have music, you know, things like that to think twice about putting it out. You know, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important. I think that one of the things that hurt DMX's career between the mid 2000s and today was there was a lot of money grabs. You know, he put out a project around 2010 just called Mixtape. Um, there was Undisputed. There was a few of these projects that I think put a little bit of money in X's pocket, but really diluted his catalog because and, and we can always have that age old debate of, you know, what's a mixtape? What's an album? There was this term back then called street albums. Um, but you had a guy who was consistently going number one, making music that appeased the core fan base. And then when that quality went down, it, it really showed. And, and I feel like, you know, we're going to use the word comeback a lot today. But I feel like a lot of those kind of misfires is what DMX's legacy is coming back from. So I support Swiss. And I think we've all seen, you know, Tupac and Big L and, um, you know, there, there's a host of artists, uh, even maybe Pimp C that you just constantly get hit with stuff. And, and what does it all mean? And on one hand, you look at it and say, well, are these, these vessels that provide for the artist's family? You know, is it necessary? Are the diehard fans curious? But on another level, I think we can both appreciate as fans of sports, athletes that walk out on top of their game. And I'm not going to say that Exodus is, is X in his finest form by no means, but it is a moment. It is a tribute. It is a send off. And you get the last word and what you do after that, you know, it can matter. So I agree with Swiss. Yeah. You know, that's why I 
hesitate on the posthumous thing. Like I said, I've never listened to a truly posthumous Tupac project. Yeah. Because I don't know that it meets his vision. And a lot of times I think that those songs weren't put out when the artist was alive for a reason. And so I kind of want to be respectful of that. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's, I guess that's all I'd say about it, but I'm happy this one came out and, um, you know, I want to dive into it. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh, one thing I want to ask you about though, is the features. Well, you know, uh, what do you think about the features kind of generally? You know, I have to say that I was somebody who was a bit skeptical. I always believed that X had it in himself to, you know, make the album that he wanted to make on his terms. I mean, DMX albums throughout history, well, he was a prominent feature artist. I don't think they were weighted with a ton of features, especially high profile ones. He put on his Bloodline crew. He would have Jay here and there, the Locks here and there, maybe Eve or Dragon. But that was more or less it as I remember it. So when you started seeing all these names, I was skeptical. And it's interesting, you know, when I saw the Ushers and the Alicia Keys and Bono, you know, even when X was alive and, and since he passed, I was real kind of nervous. Griselda was one I felt good about because in the same way you and I are equating a lineage there of, of maybe Pop Smoke and X, just in terms of content and aesthetic, not in delivery. I see that too with Griselda, even though those guys are from a different part of the Empire State. Um, and and yeah, so in theory, I was I was all over the place with it. But the, the things that I was excited about was that. Um, obviously, we've been salivating for years on the you know Nas and Jay record. And then, you know, at times we had heard something about Scarface, which for me, X and Scarface have a lot in common. And from what I know, I don't believe they ever worked together on something we've heard. So for me, that was that was big. Yeah. What about you? You know, um, before I get into that, one other thing that I wanted to touch on that you brought up was the estates. And a lot of times these projects might be done to help the artists and their family. You know, so a couple of things on that one got some pretty uh, disturbing news this week that DMX's estate is uh, reported to be less than a million dollars and potentially as low as $50,000. And so when you hear about that for artist family, that's real, especially mm -hmm. for someone who has, you know, uh, 15 kids like X, that's, you know, each one of these projects could literally represent millions of dollars for the family. And so it's hard to hate on it just because um, you, you know you might not have wanted it or the artist might have might not have uh, put it out. So that's one. But two, I think it's really really important who is in charge of the estate. And you wrote a great article um, a couple of years ago about Tom Wally, a former um, executive from uh, Warner and um, I think Interscope also. Mm -hmm. Um, taking over Tupac's estate, uh, or not the, the estate, but the, the mu being the guardian of the music. Um, that to me, because you knew how much, uh, you know, he cared about Pac's legacy, about like the, the, the working relationship they had, that gives me great comfort with Swizz at the helm, because, mm -hmm. you know, he is going to act with integrity. And so I know that anything that comes out is going to be both to the benefit of X, his legacy, and to the family. So I think that's great. Yeah, and, and I love that in hip-hop. I mean, we've seen that with Premier and Guru, you know, recently, um, and, and that was executed beautifully in, in the Gangstar album. And, you know, I often wish that Lord Finesse was the one that was in charge of Big L. Um, you know, and L has family members that have put out things that I know have frustrated some of L's closest collaborators. And yeah, this, I, I have, you know, one other thing I'll say is, you know, not to jump ahead, but, but Swizz is doing a versus, which we'll talk about. And to me, I see that as a beautiful extension of promoting an album that DMX is not here to promote. And I don't think that anything that Swizz Beats has done, this is just me personally, from his, um, you know, speech at the kind of remembrance of X, I think, I think Swizz is fighting the good fight on what Earl Simmons stood for as a man and as an artist. And I've yet to be shown otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one last thing about the album generally and why it might be, you know, the case that it should be his finale is that, as we've reported, this was his an album, his re reunion with Def Jam, mm -hmm. you know, and he got his start with Def Jam. It seems only fitting that he would finish with Def Jam. The interesting thing to me, though, is that uh, apparently Swizz had been shopping X around at multiple labels 
and Def Jam was the only label that would sign him. Uh, and uh, you know, Swift said that that, that there, there was a, a fear of liability. People thought that you know it was too much risk investing in X. Now it's, it's ironic that things turn out the way that they did, but he did deliver on the album. He did the deal with Paul Rosenberg, you know, who was president of Def Jam at the time and, and Eminem's long-term manager. And he had to actually personally vouch for um, X's reliability and that he would get it get it done. So I just I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah. And, and on that, I mean, I'm sure there's a million labels out there, you know, smaller labels and independents that operate differently that would have loved to have had this project. But I think that I imagine that DMX wanted the space to take two or three years to record an album, to use studios, you know, around the country to do features properly. So when I read that, I was like, OK, the other majors weren't at the table. And that makes sense. And honestly, um, you know, I, I hope this album I don't usually get caught up in the charts. I think sometimes I maybe do a little bit more than, than you do, but I would love to see this album, you know, represent a high position on the charts because I think that meant a lot to DMX. And let's not forget, this was a guy who a handful of times consecutively did that. And you and I talked about it in our remembrance, would have done it a sixth time, if not for one of those. Now that's what I call music compilations. And I, I think that meant something to DMX to see his rankings in the world. I mean, he was a competitive guy, a battle rapper at heart. And um, in the next, you know, 10 days or so, I'll be very curious to see where this lands for X and, and for Def Jam. Yeah, I mean, Swizz in, in closing with his uh, Breakfast Club interview said, let's make this album number one. Yeah. And he said, in, in New York, we got the power to make it, a, uh, make it number one, you know, by ourselves. I definitely, I don't think there's any doubt it'll go number one. I'm not sure that it'll ultimately outpace Cole, only because um, DMX's listening audience is not of the streaming generation natively, you know? So I'm not sure that, you know, we and he is a peer of mine um, are as active on streaming as, as J. Cole's generation. So um, th I, that would be the only thing I think that would prevent it, but I think Curiosity, um, the fact that it's a posthumous project, the fact that um, you know it's got all these features uh, of multiple generations, could bring a lot. And, and he's got timeless songs too, like you know uh, "Lose My Mind," you know, and you know uh, "Rough Riders Anthem," Th songs like that that have transcended generations. I, th I think it could it, there's it could possibly be the biggest album of the year. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious to see what happens. Um, I don't imagine there's physical copies in stores today. I think that in 2021, that's kind of changed. But a machine like Def Jam, I would bet that they'll be there over the next few days. And and one of the things I did want to say on this album, its name, its title, its artwork, a photograph by Jonathan Mannion of X's neck tattoo, its title, it's all fitting. It's packaged beautifully. And I imagine that this is an album, when you speak of generation, that people will own, that want to play in the car. And, you know, throughout this year, I live on a, you know, a prominent street. I've heard more DMX constantly. So the way that streams count to physical units, this could be a collector's item type of situation, you know? Yeah, I agree. All right, man. So let, let's get into it. Yeah. Song by song, uh, starting at the top. That's my dog. You have very specific thoughts about that. Do you want to share yeah, I mean, I, I applaud Swizz and X and the Locks. This is the tone setter. And I, I think that this is the type of song that I expected to hear on a Def Jam album with, you know, by DMX, helmed by Swiss Beats. And, you know, it's it's catchy, but there's depth there. I love the title. I love the fact that Swizz has it stuck in my head right now. Um, you know, one thing I'll add is, you know, last year X guested on the Locks album and we interviewed the Locks for this podcast and they put out the record about shit and before we spoke to the locks i was critical of that record you kind of dug it um to me there's similar collaborations but this is a much better one and uh i think it's the best way to kind of drop the album in first gear and, and get moving on it yeah i really dug that collaboration and literally just took it off our playlist uh this past week so I'm sure there's a, a breath of relief from you in that one, but <laughs> it grew on me. Yeah. What I would say about this though, is that, so I think my thought about that and why you might not have liked it is that it's, it was a very polished uh, and almost R and B like beat. And we, we all yeah. know Jake Payne does not love R and B. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this one, 
is much more rugged. This is like that smash mouth in your face, aggressive kind of music, you know? And I think that it really suits that late nineties, early O's, Locks, DMX, Rough Riders kind of collabo. And so when, when I talked about expectations and what I would want to hear or expect to hear from a DMX album coming in, this met it a hundred percent for me. You know, mm -hmm. this was exactly what I thought DMX should sound like. Um, it was nostalgic, but, but, but still updated and current. So not sounding retro and dated, you know, so, and everybody showed up and I love the fact that they celebrated each other and celebrated their bond. Yeah. You know, I thought all three members of LOX killed it. I, I, you know, I talked to Sheik for Ambrosia years ago, and I mean, he got the hook on Get At Me Dog, you know, interplaying with X. And I thought Sheik might have even had the best one there. Styles at the end kills it. It's a really great song. And one thing I'll add, I know you like to tease me about the R&B thing. To be honest, what I one of the things I most was resistant to last year with Bout Shit was X's vocals were not clear. And one of the things that Swizz said in making this album was he booked sessions, whether they were in Snoop Dogg's studio in L.A., you know, or outside of L.A., or Nashville or New York, to book them early in the day. And you know, I don't know if X was still smoking cigarettes recently, but I know that his voice, his voice, especially the way he delivered his raps, would presumably get rougher through the day. And for me, and, and we've seen that with other artists, Beanie Siegel, you know, his voice has changed a lot. Um, I like this version because X sounds crisp and clear. And, you know, it's just what I want in that chemistry between these four MCs and this great producer. And this one also is a co-production with Arab Music, who people know through Slaughterhouse and obviously his own great uh, catalog. Yeah, I agree with you on the vocal clarity. That's really, really important for me. And we're going to get into that on a, on a later song that I think was lacking that clarity and was really my only disappointment from the song. But um, next up is Bath Salts. Now this is the song that uh, Just Blaze and uh, that premiered during the first beat battle between um, Twist Beats and Just Blaze, which I think was the precursor to Versus even before, um, you know, uh, Swizz and Tim battled each other. That happened in February of 2017. Um, we're in the middle of this beat battle where they're playing classic bangers. You know, it's at, it's in some room at Hot 97. Buster Rhymes is there, Ebro, like, you know, all the like kind of like usual suspects. And out of nowhere, Swiss drops this song and it's like completely unfamiliar. People are like looking at each other like confused. Buster has this priceless look that would be a meme if it had happened right now. Um, <laughs> yeah like, you know, both confused and like, yo, this is like, and like, then you start to hear Jay and then you hear Nas and then you hear like Jadakiss and then you hear DMX and you're like, what the hell is this? Like, and shockingly to me, you know, so we, it happened, I think two and a half hours or something like that into like a three hour beat battle. Mm -hmm. So we had just posted about the beat battle first. Not we, I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah call it what it is okay yeah all right i wasn't no gonna... i'm because i'm gonna take the l here in a second yeah, i'm, not gonna, I'm going. not gonna be six nine up in here like you know so <laughs> up in here up in here so <laughs> um so that happened but i then went back and listened to it and i was like yo th there's this song and and was i the first I, I think i was one of the first because i don't remember anyone else and so then i i redid the headline and like you know said that Swizz had premiered a new song with these guys. I you know, I did a frantic Google search to like see if the lyrics had been used anywhere else and they hadn't been. And it was like, whoa, this is absolutely crazy. And to my surprise, the video stayed up. Because yeah. typically when something like that happens, it, get, it gets yanked because you know it's happened in the past. But that had people like just spinning. And for years, the song was, was known as Zombies. Um, because um, that's one of Jay's lyrics. He, he talks about zombies in, in his first verse. And a year later, like Swizz was on uh, a radio show. I can't remember if it was Who Kid or something else, but he was talking about why it hadn't been released. And um, I had a conversation actually with one of the, the artists on the album, and I won't say who, who it was, but the artist had told me that it was his uh, for his project. And, um, you know, Everybody was surprised that it got dropped like that. But finally, 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 
we got this song like uh, almost uh, four years or more than four years later. But the thing is, it came without the Jadaverse. Um, mm -hmm. And if you listen back to that clip, Swiss plays everyone's verse except for Jada in full. And Jada only has four, four bars on it. So I'm wondering if Jada ever recorded a full verse or if, or and had planned to come, or had planned yeah. to come back and finish it. But you know, any thoughts on why Jada's verse isn't on it? I went back this morning and I watched that footage and a few thoughts come to my mind. Um, you know, number one, it's amazing to me and this is a compliment to Swizz, you know, his excitement for something and his ad libs and what he's done on record and in concert so often he took this song to another level that night. And obviously none of the artists on the record were in the room at the time. So when you get to Jada's verse, Swizz starts playing with the fader and shouts out the bars. And it seems like a couple people in the room, I don't know if it's D or Wa that's next to Swizz at the time, but there's, a, there's obviously a circle that knows the joint a little bit and they have this moment, but I've been salivating for that. And so today I like your four bar point I can't imagine that Jada Kiss would not have wanted to finish the song. And I think that just the way that Exodus has gone, he would have had license to do so. Here's my theory on it. I think this is a holy trinity moment of three great MCs in New York from the late 90s, X, J, and Nas. I think they pulled Jada off the song. And, and that's big if that's coming from Swizz and you know, Def Jam and anything else, but I have a feeling, this is just me looking into a, a, a cheap crystal ball, we'll get the full version on a Lox album or on a Jada Kiss project very soon. All right, I, I'm still waiting for, I can't remember uh, what remix it is we bet on recently. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, it was like a Royce Eminem joint or something. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I, you know, part of me thought maybe it's because the Lox got their own song with X on the album. And so they didn't want to double up with Jada, but then Nas is on the album twice, but we're going to talk yeah. about that in a minute. So there wasn't, there clearly wasn't a ban on having artists appear more than once. So I don't know, man. I don't this, know. this song's interesting though. So, you know, Swiss had told GQ this week that this song originated out of the Life is Good sessions, whether or not that corroborates with, with what you alluded to a moment ago, which is crazy to me because you know, that that album, I believe, came out 2011 on uh, Nas's album. And I uh, to me, Jay's flow sounds a lot like it did on Monster, which was 2010. But there's an interesting thing about this song that you pointed out. Jay has one line that can come off as a diss. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. You know, so there's a couple of interesting things about the verses. So uh, first of all, Jay and DMX kept their verses exactly as they were uh, when it debuted. And, and you can you can hear that, you know, you can go back and Google the lyrics and they've been up since, you know, since it, it first premiered. Um, Nas apparently though, changed some of his lyrics, not all of them, some of them, because some of them uh, went to another song. And I'm not sure what, what song that is, but you know, um, that happens. But Jay, uh, who's the king of like the, the slick one-liners, you know, uh, shots, had a line where he says, come be my Kardashian, queen of the come up. Now, uh, you know, I looked at Genius and it has some like generic kind of like thing about it, but that to me, knowing kind of Jay and how intentional he is about his words, seemed to me like a shot at Kim and, uh, and uh, of course by proxy Kanye. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In November of 2016, is when Kanye was kind of going on what were being called his rants and concerts, where he would just, you know, stop and just start talking sometimes for five minutes, sometimes for 15 minutes and, and be complaining about different things. And one of them, I'm sure you recall, and a lot of our, our listeners will, that he actually took a shot at Beyonce. Um, he said that, you know, she won some award, didn't, didn't deserve to win that award over over him, which is ironic given that like, you know, his kind of fall from grace was bum rushing the stage and taking the trophy from Taylor Swift when, when she won over Beyonce saying that Beyonce should have won. But neither here nor there, um, that was in November of 2016. And it was just a few days after that, that uh, Kanye actually ended up being checked into a, a mental hospital for um, what was later to be revealed as um, him being bipolar. Mm -hmm. Now, Three months later is when Swiss Beats plays this during the Just Blaze battle. 
Um, and, you know, Jay clearly had issues with Kanye as it would come out around uh, 444. He had direct shots of Kanye on that album. He talked about how Kanye had crossed the line at going at Beyonce and Blue Ivy, their daughter, in interviews around that, the cycle of that album. So I think it's highly possible that that song was recorded shortly before uh, Swiss premiered it at that thing, uh, at, you know, and, and Jay's bars were written in. And it's possible, listen, that, that the Nas verse was written for Life is Good, the Jay verse was written, you know, during that three month period and DMX's was written, you know, uh, sometime between that. I, I mean, I, I like that theory. Jay's flow, like I said, sounds early 2010s, but you know, if it is somewhere around 2011, that's watch the throne time. There wouldn't have been, um, you know, so I also wondered this, if, you know, Kanye and, and Kim, you know, that was somewhere around 2009, 2010, you know, after Amber Rose and Jay could have very easily made that line, you know, um, prior to that, he had that line, I think on ignorant shit on American gangster about, you know, these, these celeb showing their kittens, like, he was going at that community of Paris Hilton and the Kodak, you know, all of that at that time. So maybe he made that line prior to that happening, which also makes me wonder if that was one of the holdups of this song, because, you know, OK, I said that now I said that then I can't release it now. But it, it just it does make you wonder. And if I'm you know, one thing I will say is I believe in the GQ article. It's not Swizz. It's the writer that. um confirms that and obviously there's fact checking and all of that but um you know it's interesting interesting to wonder i'm glad we got the song now i um i would love to hear the full and proper jadakiss verse because what i did hear over those four or so bars i really liked and i think it would have been a moment for jadakiss to stand in the sun with with three three peers and um but i'll, I'll take what i can get yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Jay had the ability to re-record the verse if he chose. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And Swiss was saying that, like, you know, uh, he approved it. So I'm not sure if he had done it, then um, it flips it almost. And you start to think, well, was Kanye kind of justified if, if Jay is doing things that could be perceived to be taking shots, you know, and clearly since Big Brother, and that was what, 2007 or something like that? Yeah. Uh, you know, since before that, they've had kind of like a, um, a competitive rivalry, uh, brotherhood, brotherly rivalry, but still a rivalry nonetheless. So, you know, uh, but I can't remember them taking shots at each other publicly prior to that. And this would have been public had he, had he done so. So I don't know. Yeah, man. I like my theory. I'm, I think this is something that we'll get more information on as people talk, as Jadakiss talks. Um, and, you know, Jay hasn't really done a huge press run in a while. Great record. I, yeah, the bath salts comes out of the same lyric that the zombies, you know, presumed title came out of. Um, just, just interesting. But again, it, there's something special of that moment in 2017. Um, what Swizz adds to the song in the live performance. And I give you a lot of credit, man. I was thinking of that today. I thought it was a really cool battle, but you went there and, and, you know, trudged through three hours of it and caught that moment. I remember exactly where I was when you called me and you, and you did it a couple of times in 2017, but that was one of our biggest, um, you know, moments of that year as a site. Yeah. I remember where I was too, man. I was in Miami uh, taking a break from my, my, my friend's bachelor. Oh, yo. Okay. This is going to crack the cranium, right? Yeah. So I was at my friend's bachelor party in Miami. Um, you know, we went hard all weekend. And so I'm, I'm sure I was, you know, hung over in the room, just kind of like taking it easy. And that's when I caught it. It was at that same friend's wedding three months later uh, in April um, that I decided to write the Kendrick Lamar damn piece. Yeah. Again, like hard weekend. <laughs> so. Maybe I need to start drinking heavily yeah. before, before these podcasts. But <laughs> That's funny. It's crazy, too. I thought of it today. That day you called me was a friend of mine's birthday, Shavar. He listens to this podcast a lot, and, and I appreciate that. And today he's getting married. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I stepped out of his party for your phone call. And today when we finally get to hear it is his big day. So just crazy times. That's where that's dope. Yeah, before we get to the next one, though, I got to ask. Yeah. Who had the best verse? HOV, 
I've uh, wow. yeah, that's that's my opinion. X is X is right there. I think X has better verses on this album, and I think the fact that we're sitting here getting surgical, um, I like Jay's, and it's funny too. You know, one of the things whenever he made it, there's a few references to coming to America. Who would have thunk that in 2021, when coming to America, you know, dominated the cycle for a moment in February? You know, that line is even more relevant now than whenever it was recorded. But that's me. Who do you think has the best? Yo, interesting. I think it's Nas, man. Mm. Um, I, you know, when I listened to it, you know, I wasn't sure. And to your point that you wrote in the document, X sounds fantastic on this verse. Yeah. Uh, really clear, really strong, like peak X form. But reading what Nas is saying lyrically, yo, I think he, he I think he went in. And um you know, if we're going back to sorry, not sorry, um, I think Nas might have gotten the, 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 the last two. I think he might have gotten his last two, for me at least. Yeah, it's interesting that you and I, I Jay is not by much. Um, I don't think it's X on this one, but I love for the reasons you just said, it's, it sounded like X in a great moment. And I know that this record had to have meant a lot to him, um, you know, because of the collaborative histories with these artists individually. But uh, yeah, I'll rest my case on Jay with this one. Yeah. All right. So next one is Dogs Out. Um, and this one features Lil Wayne and Swizz. Um, you really like this one. You want to break it down? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like the song. I, I have to say, this is my personal opinion that, you know, apart from DMX and Jay-Z, I think that Swizz catalog is at its best with Wayne. Um, I know there's, you know, MCs that he's worked with a lot more, you know, in terms of a volume of songs, but they just have a special chemistry. And you pointed out something, I think, I think in a, a lot of ways, this song is kind of an homage or a, a part to a pivot to uproar, you know, Wayne's, Wayne's joint. I think in both of these, you can hear that undertone of special delivery by G Depp and the, you know, bad boy family. And I think it's interesting too, you know, Swizz has done that before, and I know we don't necessarily think of Swizz as a DJ like we might with, you know, Just Blaze or Premier, you know, et cetera. But Swizz at, at certain points in his career has made a record and then made another record that you can transition into that record really well. Um, I thought of, you know, uh, the, the T.I. joint and the Cassidy I'm a Hustler. Um, T.I.'s Bring Them Out. And, you know, both of those songs had a similar, you know, kind of vibe. And Ara obviously both had a Jay-Z, not a scratch chorus, but a vocal chorus that was pulling from another record. And Swizz does that. And I think this is a setup. And um, I thought the energy was high. This is one of the higher energy songs on the album. And I thought it was a fitting joint to put right after Bath Salts. But what did, you know, what did you think? Yeah, man, this is one I'm going to have to listen to more. Um, you know, so not, uh, one of the things about my ears when I hear a song that sounds a lot like another song, um, it needs to it needs to be a different enough or an upgrade enough for me to really say, "Huh, this is dope, unexpected, really pleasing. I really dig it." You know, um, this one to me almost sounded like a bit of a a, a sound alike. You know. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm, I've always been deeply respectful of Wayne, but it's never he's never been one of my favorite MCs. And so, you know, I've listened to it a couple of times, and um, it's grown on me. But it, it, it's thus far, this is the one where I start to check out a little bit. You know, um, and to oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. To be clear, I would not put this song in my top five of the album. You know, of the ten, but it's it's one that I think is in the middle for me. I don't love it. I like it. I don't dislike it. But to what you just said, this spot in the album is where things, um, you know, aren't my favorite, you know, on Exodus, just to be just to be candid. Yeah. So, I mean, that takes us to the next one. Money, money, money. Uh, featuring Money Bag Yo. Now, we talked about Pop Smoke and DMX had talked about Pop Smoke being on the album on Drink Champs. And this apparently is the song that Pop Smoke was supposed to be on, but similar to the Nas verse on Bass Salts, apparently um, another song, um, this, the, his vocals were featured on another song. And so they had to take his vocals off, which is unfortunate because it would have been dope to hear X and Pop Smoke together. But, but you know, for me, uh, this is my least favorite 
song on the album. Um, Same. I, I don't like the track. I just don't like the track um, at all, actually. And it's, it's not one that I could ever see kind of growing on me. It's just yeah. not my taste, you know. Um, and so I don't even know that with, with Pop Smoke's vocals, it would have really changed the outcome for me. But, but what are your thoughts? I agree with everything you said. I was, I, when I when on the album came, I looked for Pop Smoke. I didn't see it. I was surprised to see Moneybag Yo. He's an artist that I would admit I'm newish to the party. We had him on the site by way of a J. Cole collaboration. And I remember you and I had a difference of opinion on whether or not that should have even been covered in the first place. And that was during Cole's feature run. And, you know, the other day, this week, I was at the, I was at the gas station and the guy next to me was blasting his music. And I really liked it and I shazammed it and it was money bag. Yo, like a five-year-old song. And there's moments a few times like that, where I've been exposed to stuff he's done and I like it. And I think his, his aesthetic is very much like a bully aggressive. So in theory, it made sense to me. This is the weakest link of the album. I, I think the biggest fault of the song is the beat. Um, and then also on top of it, what X is rapping about, I mean, there is some substance there because he's also kind of decrying money a bit, but it's, it's very, uh, it reminds me a lot of that material that we got from X in the early 2010s that was just kind of churn it out, sell it, put it out, cash grab, uh, no pun intended. And, and the beat reminded me a lot of, you know, and I say this respectfully, this beat reminded me a lot of cats that were trying to imitate stoop from jedi mind tricks and just couldn't do it right and you would find a real like circusy grabby beat that gets stuck in your head i found this one grating um you know it is it is my weakest link on the album hands down yeah kind of ringtone rap almost um, yeah 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 it, it, this if there's anyone where i thought it was forced maybe to to um bring in that level of like you know being current this is the one I think that that would fit that mold for me. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, Moneybag Yo and Pop Smoke are both, you know, big grabs. But this one and now that we know the context, it felt like a last minute, like, who can we get right now? And uh, yeah, I just not not feeling it. And I'd I'd be shocked if fans of Moneybag Yo, if that brought them to DMX's party, because it just doesn't feel like the one. But um, you know that was a that was a collaboration. I can't even say they let me down, but this is this is my more, most disappointing part in the album. I, I'm going to admit it. You know, moving on to the next song, "Hold Me Down" with Alicia Keys. In theory, the Alicia Keys feature and the Usher feature, you know, didn't interest me. And, and you can tease me and say that's because, you know, of my stance with R&B. I am a fan of Alicia Keys. The songs by her that I like are often songs that Alicia Keys fans um you know hate on uh try sleeping with a broken heart is one of my favorite alicia keys songs and so many people have been like Oof. um i think this moment this song is one of the times on the album where they got the pop aspect of dmx right um alicia you know really kind of you know provides the evocative space to let you hear in a very short verse what dmx has to say and he alludes to some of the pain in his life that you and I have talked about. And if, if there's a tribute at the Grammys in, in 2022, this is the song I can see them using, even maybe in the remembrance. It just has that, you know, it has that, you know, that tribute effect that makes for me, as somebody who doesn't seek these moments out, it makes the hairs on my arms stand up. It's just one of those joints. Yeah. Now this one's really interesting for me too. Um, you know, I think I've said, and I heard someone talking about this in the podcast too, that a lot of people listen to music this way. My first pass is, is really about the, the beat, the, the production. And if that's, then my second pass for rap at least is typically the flow. How well does the person's cadence match the production? And then the third is um, I'll start to dive into the lyric. If, if I get past the first two and it get, get, keeps me coming back, then I'll dive into the lyrics. Now with this, I truncate that exercise because, you know, we've got to, you know, have that process happen within a 24 hour period or however long it is instead of two weeks or whatever. So it'll take, I'll get to the lyrics much faster. And this is one where I really liked the production and I really liked Alicia's vocals. And I, I love the fact that, so she typically has very, very big vocals, you know, um, 
and you know, obviously she can, she can sing softly at times too, but you know, um, but she's noted for those big kind of belted out kind of like vocals. Um, this one though, she was very muted, um, subdued and very um, kind of stately and elegant in it and it sounded really, really good. And it wasn't about her. It was almost like Beyonce on, um, you know, um, Family Feud and, and, and stuff like that where she took the back seat, right? This is about the MC, I'm here to support. And so that was dope. And then uh, just sonically, I love the production, you know, um, but then when I got to the lyrics, it went to a whole different level for me. You know, Swiss has said that, especially the second verse was as real and uncut as you'll ever find DMX. And there's a line where he says, man, it hurts when people that I love don't want me. And that ties directly to something that Swiss spoke about at the memorial service about people not giving X his flowers when he was here. Um, and that X, you know, he didn't want people's, you know, money or anything like that. He just wanted their love. And, you know, there's a, I don't know who he's talking about. There's a clear, it's clearly talking about very specific people, you know, and so to hear him pour his heart out like that on a record, that just speaks to why DMX is the artist that he is, you know, 22 years later and why his, you know, passing meant so much to so many people because he's often just spoken to people because he's been so transparent and authentic and truth resonates. Yeah. Truth, people identify with truth. 100%. And I think X throughout his career will do that on a song that seems like it's about one thing. He'll drop that DMX truism. And I, I looked at that line and I thought it might have something to do with his upbringing. You know, I didn't even look contemporarily. I thought, you know, this was a guy who was finding his way in the world. And we talked about the times that he had been let down you know, in the streets of Yonkers by peers and stuff like that. And that line, I mean, of all the album, that is one of the lines that in, in the song we'll talk about, you know, regarding his son that just really kind of hit me in the ribs. But, you know, when you think of an album of DMX on Def Jam and a certain sound, you think of Swizz Beats overseeing a DMX album. It's not going to be all the, you know, that Swizz sound. You're going to get these too. And this song has a lot of polish. I really agree with what you said about Alicia playing in an assisting role to that. And um, it's this is easily one of my five songs that I grabbed to and one that I will remember this album by for through the ages. Yeah, yeah. You know, so next up is uh, an interesting contrast because it features another very distinct and well known singer, Bono from U2. And, you know, people will recall that Bono was on Kendrick's album. And when I first heard that, you know, I had a similar reaction. To that now, first of all, let me say, you two, as you know, is one of my favorite groups of all time, like all, all time. And um, you know, Unforgettable Fire, uh, War, uh, the Joshua Tree, that that trio, like I'll put it against any artist like catalog in, in terms of like you know, a three pack. Um, and you know, some of the biggest memories of my life. So I love Bono, I, I love his voice, but when I hear him potentially collaborating with rap artists, it just doesn't sound right to me because he's not that type of, it, it, in my head, he's not that type of artist, right? Going back to what we're talking about in terms of expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when I heard that he was gonna be on Kendrick Lamar's Damn, I was like, damn, what is Kendrick doing? You know, um, that, that sounds- What like is Jimmy Iovine doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds like a real reach to me. Um, but he again, took a back seat and was very muted on that album. And it was um, very understated. And, you know, that song though, was not one of my favorite songs in the album for a long time. But after I spent a few months with the album, maybe a few years, and even it might've been, you know, our um, AFH extended family, Justin Hunt's um, breakdown of like the song and uh, what it meant to his generation, the hardest generation alive, I guess your generation too, um, that I really went back and checked it out again. And I want to listen to dissect hearing the lyrics, but now it's one of my favorite songs on the album. And especially when I listen to it in reverse order, because the transition is so much smoother. So um, all that to say that my first impression of this was I didn't love the song itself, you know, um, it, it sounded a bit like a disconnect. The, the beat you get is the, the pick and boogers beat, which um, a lot of people recognize as the soul to soul, keep on moving beat, you know, mm -hmm. um, and paid in full. And like, 
it's been it's been a class a classic kind of like hip hop soul beat and uh, I'm sure it predates even the songs that I named but when you first hear it, it's just a beat and it's like yo this is about to be a hip hop joint and like how's Bono gonna fit on this and then the, the instrumentals come in and it, it slips into kind of rock mode but they don't necessarily fit together in my mind as I expected so I need to like this is one where I think if I give it more time I'm gonna end up liking it a lot more but I will say substantively um it's one of the most powerful songs in the album for me. And, you know, X has got several bars that I just thought were heavy. One is don't always laugh, but every day I cry. And, you know, you think about um, slipping. Uh, he says uh, in the beginning to live is to suffer. Um, um, and, but um, to be wise is to like um, learn from the suffering or something like that. But yeah. it's really about that evolution and like, not just taking the suffering, but learning from it and getting better from it. He also says, I just want to be heard, fuck the fame, you know, which seems like a, a direct throw to that line from the last song. He says, my words will live forever, fuck my name. And then I was born in the dirt, just like you planted the seed, let me grow. Just real deep, man. Um, again, just showcases the poet that, that DMX is and, and why people love him. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's textbook X, I thought of it you know, I, I remember, um, I still do, but I was involved with the group that was, you know, taught at a college level, you know, systems of oppression, you know, taught people what racism, what homophobia, what ageism, all these things look like. I mean, this was in the mid 2000s. And there was a student in the class that said that DMX helped him learn English. Um, he was from India. And, you know, there's times where X can be very simple. And I think those bars you just read, you know, fit that in terms of, just you know the lexicon and vocabulary and but there's so much depth there and i've met several people in my encounters and i've thought of them over the last couple months that you know x kicked knowledge to them in a way that they could apply it to their life and i know he's done it certainly for me and i'm sure for you and tupac had that same quality of sometimes simple but so much power and you get that in this song and and i like that aspect of it i don't i don't love skyscrapers i it sounded familiar when I heard it and, and maybe for the reasons you mentioned regarding the sample, but, you know, from what Swiss said or, or what I've read, you know, this song leaked almost 10 years ago and one version of it apparently had Kanye West on it. I don't remember that. I remember there was a period of time where, you know, there was a dump of, of X music and that was a time when, you know, stuff would release and you didn't know if it was manufactured or if it was really Bono. Um, I, I have to say, you know, I don't feel the way that you feel about XXX on the damn album by Kendrick. I'm a fan of you too, not to the extent that you are, um, but I own their albums. I know their music pretty damn well. And I think this is the third time, um, you know, Bono did something with Wyclef Jean, the Kendrick album, um, and now this, and none of those times really kind of work for me. Um, and I, I, I kind of asked myself the question and I want your thoughts when you take somebody of that level, you know, of that level in rock and they bring them into hip hop, you know, this has happened, you know, Ozzy Osbourne on Busta's album, um, you know, Phil Collins working with Bone Thugs and Harmony and later Lil' Kim, um, you know, on and on. Do you think that it ever measures up to the vision or the intent? You know, I'm trying to think of like other collaborations. Usually the, the, one, the ones that come to mind for me are the ones where the rapper appears on the um, the rock artist song, you know? Yeah. And so uh, one of the songs I really like is um, the, the song with uh, Maroon 5 featuring Kendrick Lamar. I, I, think that, I think that's just super dope. It's true to Kendrick, it's really you know great for them. You know, as I think about it, the ones that have worked the best for me are where um, it's truly been a partnership. So. Lincoln Park Jay-Z, you know, I thought that that project was incredible. And the uh, um, Dirt on Your Shoulders Numb mm. mashup was... I like that too. And I hated on Lincoln Park at the time. I'll admit that. And I really like that song. That one is mind blowing to me. And the other one is, um, again, not to be a Kendrick stand, but um, his performance on the Grammys with Imagine Dragons. And after he had lost, you know, the album, album of the best rap album to like Macklemore, Good Kid, Mad City versus, um, you know, the heist or whatever the, the um, 
the Macklemore album was, and no shade of Macklemore because I do like Macklemore, but um, just seeing Kendrick and the passion that he brought to that performance was was, and I was in the building. Oh, was chilling. Made made my made my the hair stand up on my arm. So, those are some of the best rap rock collaborations I can think of. You know, um, what about you? Are there any that that work? Yeah, for you? I mean, I think I think you know all props due to Aero Smith and Run DMC. And you know, I know what is it the Trespass soundtrack where there was some dope you know rap rock you know collaborations that way. The two that I really bond with and they weren't on wax they were in performance was staying with puffy and the family for i'll be missing you just a beautiful moment um and you talk about send off and then also i'm a big fan i i think it was a brilliant moment of eminem uh with elton john doing stan and as much as i was a little bit bummed because you know i, I love dido and 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 i love that song and that whole moment with 45 King and everything, I thought Elton just smashed that in whenever that was, 2002, 2001. Um, so yeah, but this one isn't that, oddly enough to me, I thought Bono, and, and tell me I'm wrong, but I felt, I felt like at some points he even sounded like Sting on this one. But I'll be curious to see if this is a song that grows on me, but, but right now this and Money, 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 um, you know, which are just two songs apart from each other on the album, they're my weak links. And so the middle of the album uh, gets a little slow for me to be to be quite transparent. Yeah, I mean, so next up is Stick Up Skit. And this is another one where context is really important because I hadn't focused on something until uh, you pointed it out. But this features Ice Pick, um, you know, who is Jedekus's, uh late manager um, and also, uh, or you say he's late, is, is, is he his manager, is, his manager or no? I believe so. From what I, from what the pull up with Jadakiss and Joe Budden a couple years ago, um, I learned that, yeah. Yeah, and Swiss, you know, and he did all the X skits. And so it makes sense that, that, that if there's gonna be a skit that, that he would have one of them. It was, before I knew that, I saw it as out of step with the, the tone of the rest of the album because Swiss has really presented this project as DMX's evolution and the manifestation of him in 2021 versus who he was when he first started. And you know, just the, the substance of it to me reminds me of what you would hear on one of those you know first albums. Um, um, without much more beyond that, and so I just I, it was a head scratcher for me. But knowing the history behind it, um, you know, I, I think I think it uh, I, I completely understand why they would include it in the project. Yeah, I mean, Cross was one of X's artists on Bloodline, I believe. They had rapped together on I think Year of the Dog again on a song and infrared. Um, I don't love the moment and in all respect due to first of all, you know, Ice Pick as well as X. I don't love skits. If they're not made by Riza or Prince Paul, um, oftentimes or Dr. Dre, I just don't love skits in my life and you know this album's trying to achieve a, a very specific tone and i mean what do you do with this because i'm sure you know there was a close relationship of these guys and you want to have them involved in some way but i just don't think that was that was the move um but i think swizz pointed out that there have been you know stick up skits you know throughout x's catalog and it was one of those homages i just don't know that it lands for you know for your confusion not confusion but for your initial reaction and also mine um yeah um i don't know yeah yeah well one thing that landed like spectacularly is the next song um and that was hood blues and that single dropped um earlier this week you know i, I heard this the sample and i was trying to think of what it was um then i went back and researched it but it's loop pack you know um you know answers with mad lib and then uh sean price did it on his figure four uh it's like a two minute drop from from kimbo price incredible um, yeah okay. and it just is such for for heads for true hip-hop heads you recognize that beat instantly from every freestyle you know that yeah <laughs> yeah just ill and but then to hear you know, West Side Gun, Benny the Butcher, and Conway the Machine from Griselda on it with DMX was unreal. And so there was a lot of anticipation for this one. I would say, I would venture to say it was probably the most anticipated song of the album. Hmm. It was even the J, um, Jada Kiss, and Nas one. We had heard that, you know, but we had not heard this. 
And so when I heard that, I, it was instantly likable. Now, the, the only thing that I didn't like about it and sadden me is that X's vocals were not clear. Uh, really, they were actually very hard for me to understand. And it took kind of reading the, the lyrics and like listening intently. Um, and I wonder if it ties back to your point about Swizz recording with him earlier, you know, um, in the day. It turns out that X actually went into the studio and this beautiful story went into Griselda's studio and Swiss didn't even know about it, you know, so it like ins it inspired him because X was so motivated and it shows how much he respected the Griselda crew that he wanted to be in their space, you know, kind of touch their energy and apparently energy was very important to him and, uh, and record this song. And so, you know, I love everything about it. Um, I just wish that his vocals were clear. What do you think? I love everything about it too. That's, that's the phrase I use. You know, I look at X, I look at Griselda. Yes, you've got the hardcore new New York, you know, overlap decades apart. But also, I mean, these four MCs are guys, especially X, Conway and Benny in their deliveries. These are guys that, that battle the microphone, you know, like the showmanship of battle rap of like, let me have a conversation and I'll break the flow to drive my point home. All three of these guys do it. X did it phenomenally. I mean, you got it at, you got it at places like, like, you know, Jay-Z did it on Reasonable Doubt with Friend or Foe, but X, as a, as a street battle MC who sustained his name long before the Def Jam deal, he brought that energy of, of let me hold court this way with my delivery to so many of his albums. And I remember, you know, watching Benny, um, you know, it was the first time I saw him on, on TV, certainly, with the Shady Freestyle uh, for the BET Awards. And he did the same thing of like, I'm going to break flow and talk to you almost as a display and exercise of battle rap and bring it home. So I love that overlap. I thought all three of the guests brought their A game. Um, I agree with you on X. It makes me wonder if, you know, I don't know if the studio is in Buffalo or in Atlanta or New York City, but I wonder if it was a mid or after or during a night of partying or whatever. It's not, but the vocal on X's part is rough. Um, you know, that being said, I mean, over the years, how many times have we heard, you know, Method Man sniff in the middle of a verse or, you know, you think of some of the Juice Crew stuff where there's flaws in those records that live forever. I'm going to take it. This is my favorite song on the album from a listenability standpoint. I think the collaboration more than delivered. Um, you mentioned uh, Loot Pack and Answers. Um, shout out to Pace One from The Outsiders and Ski Beats with I Declare War. This sample and this because it's always used the same way. It's always just like a straight loop. I'd love to read an article, um, you know, uh, maybe Passion of Whites, so if somebody will kick it on, on how it really evolved. And then Sean Price revived it so much with figure four. But it's interesting. I mean, Swizz produced a loop. Um, and he did that before. He did that on Dr. Carter from the Carter Three with the David Axelrod Holy Thursday I think he did a little more than just let the loop roll for, you know, the, the, the uproar with Wayne that we talked about, but this is the production that I imagine. And it really appeases, um, it appeases the fan in me that love those moments of like, uh, you know, the, the, the murder incorporated stuff that X did with Jay-Z and Ja Rule, where they were just phenomenal grimy beats and they did their damn thing. And at a time when, the three Griselda guys are going and, you know, I mean, they're, they're clearly a unit, but they're all putting out solo projects. We're not getting them as a, as a unit on wax every time. This was a special moment, especially after last year. Um, one of my favorite songs of 2020 was Think of the Locks. Um, you know, the large professor joint from the Locks album with these guys. So I love the Rough Riders Griselda overlap collaboration. Yeah, and I really love how they handed off um, between each other and the verses, you know, so they didn't necessarily finish each other's lines, but they did uh, at least a couple times hand off in the middle of a bar. So, you know, one person would say one line and the other person would come in with, with the, the closing part of yeah. the bar. So it was just purely seamless. And it reminded me of, you know, one of my biggest, like, um, disappointments was that we weren't able to air the TDE cipher, the way that it was recorded. And there, there were business considerations that I can't get into. But when, when TDE did their cipher, you know, the one to shook ones where Kendrick like blacked out, um, they 
did it in the same way where they pass off right to each other. In fact, they actually finished each other's verses and it was completely seamless. Um, but we, had, we, we cut it up with, with scratches in between each verse. And so it took away from that, that seamless flow. But dude, it was incredible witnessing it like, um, like in person. It, it, was, it was great. And this brought that same kind of energy for me. That's, that's a dope point. And one thing I'll say, I mean, apart from Moneybag Yo, possibly Lil Wayne, I mean, you know, when we heard about these features, there's always that, there's always that concern, especially coming after a pandemic with quarantine, that the features are going to be, you know, phoned in or emailed. And, you know, you don't expect that with the locks and that certainly didn't happen. Um, Griselda, you don't get it. Like the features on this album feel organic and honest and you know when we talk about posthumous albums that are sometimes produced after the fact that's a risk and with Griselda I was curious about that um you know so I'm really really happy to know that this was done in the spirit that it was done and that we get to hear it Word. so next up was Take Control and this is uh his song with Snoop this song was a direct result of their verses. And, you know, Swiss has talked about how the album really kind of came into its final form after verses for two reasons. One, because in doing that, X really understood the love that was still out there for him and that the audiences were checking for him and really did want to hear his music. And so it kind of galvanized them. The second thing is that, you know, that was recorded at Snoop's Compound. And Snoop was apparently the ultimate host and he invited them to stay on for a while. And it was a natural place to record. It was in LA and so people were flowing through. Um, There's a lot more foot traffic than there was when he was in Nashville. And so it just made the, the process much easier for him. But this song, man, um, this song, it, it uses a sample from Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing pretty um, robustly. Um, it's, I'd say it's, it's pretty as prominent as Just Like Music for Eric Sermon. Read my mind. You know, um, and it sounds just beautiful, um, just amazing. The production is lush. And it's, you know, I think it could be basically a sequel to What These Bees Want. You know, it's, it's basically that song like updated for 2021. Um, Cause it's not, I wouldn't call it a love song. It's almost like a scolding kind of song, like, uh, you know, telling a woman on what she's missing by, you know, behaving in a certain way. And so, um, but Snoop and, and DMX just like smash it. And this is, this might be my favorite song. Of the album. Well, well, musically, this is probably my favorite song on the album. It's, it's a toss up between this and Hood Blues. But I, I just love this song. But what did you think? About yeah, it? I mean, you said that really well. And, and I, you read my mind on the Eric Sermon music joint. Um, you know, one of the things I, I've, I've always enjoyed about Snoop when I've been around him is that he plays what he wants to hear. His, like me, you know, his music is always on. I think you're the same way. And he loves that, you know, from the 60s into the early 80s, especially R&B. So to hear it referenced that way, one of my favorite songs, I, I thought it was great. And it's a co-production with Swizz and Danon Porter, Mr. Porter from D12, who I think is an undersung producer, um, hands down. What I like about the record is, you know, throughout his whole career, DMX made hyper-masculine rough sex records. Like, I mean, that was very much in vogue in the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, just yesterday, I was playing Wildflower by, you know, Ghostface Killer. And I was like, damn, this would never come out today. Um, but it's part of who he is. And, you know, I, I don't want to speak for women, but I sense that women loved X for that. I mean, he said what others wouldn't and he meant it. And Snoop, that's true of as well. I mean, you look at Snoop's catalog and here in the 2020s, or, you know, presumably after Versus in 2020, these guys made a record that I think is bold. Um, that is not in line with the way, you know, artists talk today. And, you know, it's, I don't think it's, it's, it's flagrant, but it's, it's, it's what they're about and it has a theme. And at the one hand, you have a very direct, you know, abrasive, uh, like you really want to do that message with a smooth beat. And I like that juxtaposition, the polish is there. And it just, it feels like two artists um, from across the country uh, being themselves. And I love the fact that it came after Versus, which meant so much to X's career at the time and allowed some great history with Snoop because I don't, these guys hadn't really worked together before, right? 
Uh, not that I recall. I mean, it's possible, but I, I don't recall. I always think World War Three. You know, the Rough Riders joint with Snoop and Scarface, but it was Jada Kiss. It wasn't X on it, and and maybe they did, but never to this magnitude. And and I I echo your point, Reggie. Like I think this is a real gem on the album, and it it really kind of, um, you know, Griselda's hardcore. This drops it into a smooth gear that I think ultimately gives the album its its landing strip you know, and kind of the last act. Yeah. And, and I think more than any other song on this album, potentially, this shows just how true to X's vision the album is because, you know, Swizz was talking about how expensive it was to clear mm. that sample. And yeah, Robin was, Thicke can tell you that one. Ooh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think they took a hundred, a hundred of that song. Uh, so, you know, but, you know, for those out there, uh, a lot of times, in clearing samples, you have to first give an advance of sorts, and that can be pretty hefty. And then it's against um, it's against uh, royalties, and then the 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 sample holder gets a percentage. And sometimes that's you know five percent, ten percent, twenty percent. Other times it's fifty percent, seventy five percent, a hundred percent. And just based on you know the way that Swizz was talking about it, I would assume this one was fifty percent or more. Huh. Um, and so the state got a nice chunk of change on this one, but um, it's a dope, it's a dope use and incredible. And, you know, it wouldn't have been the same song without it. Yeah. And that, I mean, just to iterate a point you made earlier, like that's something you're going to get with Def Jam versus to going to an indie or something like that to do this record the right way, especially when you're dealing with Marvin Gaye's catalog. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that X and Swiss made that decision because um, we get it. Yeah. So next up was Walking in the Rain. And that song is, you know, the, another person that had been teased uh, about appearing on the album was Scarface. He and Pop Smoke are the two, I think, most prominent individuals who we thought was gonna be on the album and were not. Um, but according to Swiss, this is the song that Scarface was supposed to be on. And he had every intention of being on it, but due to um, health issues, he wasn't able to, to be on it. And as we reported over the last year or so, Scarface has really been hampered by kidney problems. And he also had a really, really, really severe um, bout with COVID. And so um, it's understandable why he wasn't able to finish it, but it's a shame because uh, apparently he was X's favorite artist. You know, Swiss tells a story about how um, they were driving one day and X saw that Scarface was playing in concert and Swiss was like, oh yeah, where? And he was like, uh, Boston. And they'd already been driving for three hours and Boston was a five hour drive from where. And they were in Swiss's McLaren and X was like, yo, can we go? <laughs> He's like, yeah, five hours? Like, where else is he playing? Like, you know, yeah. this can't be his only show, but they ended up driving. And apparently during that drive about two hours in, Swiss, uh, X asked Swiss if he had a device to record him. He's like, what do you mean? Like, I got my phone. So yeah, so he set him up with voice memos and X basically recorded the story of his life over three hours, um, the entire time, uh, really just leaving nothing unsaid, like trusting Swiss with his entire life. And so mm -hmm. there's that recording, which obviously could, obviously could be TV series, movies, documentaries, whatever. And the other thing before I forget uh, about the album is that it was, uh, the entire thing was documented, uh, was filmed. And um, you know, Swiss said that they could have released it in snippets, but sticking true his intent to really curate and be thoughtful about this, he now wants to make it into something bigger. So it suggests to me they're gonna make a documentary on the making of Exodus, which would be really dope. But Walking in the Rain, for me is another one of those songs that really just showcases what's so special about DMX, you know, uh, lines like, and, and you only truly suffer if you remain the same, mm -hmm. let the dirt, um, you, you do, you, uh, you go through, change you and don't forget even Satan was an angel. Like, I mean, who says that, man, those, those, those are, those are masterful, really powerful lines. And so this is, this is one of those songs that I mentioned that I kind of passed over the first time around. But as I listen to it more and more, it's become one of my favorite songs in the album. 
Yeah, it's another one that has polish, another Mr. Porter, you know, Swiss production. Um, you know, it's it's slow and steady. And, you know, that's uh, that's Exodus Sun, you know, on there. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exodus. Um, and yeah. And I, I'm with you. It's one of those that last night didn't stick to my ribs in a way that, you know, five or six listens in it, it does. And um, yeah, it's just that. It's that type of joint that I don't know would ever be a single, but that were keystones in DMX albums when he was on top of his game. And uh, yeah, I like it. And, you know, you uh, presumably Nas, you know, stepped in for face. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard, but that's what my assumption was too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, well, shout actually, out to, you know, I'll say this though, uh, before you, you yeah. it might change with you, but I, I, I think that, um, uh, I think that it's very possible that Swizz had another Nas verse and he used it for this uh, rather than Nas, you know, coming on and hearing what DMX was saying and then adding his thoughts on it. Cause th there, there isn't really much connection between the two verses. Right. So it makes me think that it makes me think that, that this might've been another Nas verse that he was like, yo, cool. Well, and that's an excellent point because I mean, I get the sense over recent years, apart from hit boy, you know, Swizz has albums done with Nas and they've been, you know, locked in. And that's a really, the fact that the verses aren't really, you know, connected like that. I, I support that evidence. Yeah. Yeah. And that also might, um, you know, be why Nas got a second look, even though Swizz maybe was trying to keep it to one person and why Jada got pulled off for that first one. But, you know, we will know in time, but you mentioned Exodus being on that song. The next song, the next thing um, up is an Exodus skit. And, you know, um, Exodus was, you know, it's interesting because, and we'll get into this, um, I think he was DMX's youngest son. And, um, and he makes an appearance on this album. And there's a song that we're going to talk about next to DMX's first song. So there's a kind of like poetic kind of like, you know, circle there between the sons, but according to Swizz, Exodus and DMX were really, really, really tight before he passed because he was living with X full time. Um, he was in the studio for much of the album. So to me, this skit, unlike the other one we talked about, you know, feels more evolved and of what X is in 2021. Yeah. You know? So to have his son on this, it's no different than having Blue Ivy on, on, you know, on skits and songs and stuff like that. It seemed really fitting, but what were your thoughts about it? Yeah, I mean, well said. I, I knew, you know, you hold an album in your hands and you know, like, you know, when you see Letter to My Son, the next song, that it's going to be heavy. Like, you just know, especially coming from X, you know, as a father and who's not here and knowing where it is in the album and, and this skit definitely you know, is, is the buffer. And for me, you know, like this is where the album, you know, you're at kind of the, the, the crescendo. Yeah. So let us see my son is next. What you want to break? Oh, you actually, you said, um, model after crime story. Yeah. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I think that, I think that was in reference to walking in the rain. I, yeah. one, of the, one of the interviews I saw of Swizz, he just, there were certain chambers maybe in flow and in tone that they were trying to channel back. And oddly enough, I mean, walking in the rain had a feel to Swizz and X of crime story, which I believe is from it's dark and hell is hot. And it's just, I find that interesting. And I, I put it in our document just to say that these guys, when you talk about going for legacy, they were aware. And I think X wanted, even though crime story is not a joint that people know by heart, maybe, they wanted to connect the dots 23 years later. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So letter to my son. Um, what were your thoughts about this song? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's very, it's very heavy. These songs are always um, interesting to me. I mean, songs about fathers and sons are, are heavy stuff. And, you know, Smith and Weston a few years ago, each tech and steel, you know, made a joint dedicated to their children, which wasn't, you know, all, all sunshine and flowers. And this one, same, I mean, X apologizes. And at one point in the song, you know, he says, you don't do drugs because you watched me do them, which is another one of those bars that um, sticks to your ribs, not because of the mention of drugs, but because this is a father 
confessing his sins and, and kind of asking for forgiveness to his child, which is heavy. And there's, there's reference to, you know, the, the, like, I want you to know that I'm close to you. You mentioned, you know, this is to his oldest son, even though his oldest son is watching him with all of these other children. And I just, you know, this hit me. I mean, it was one of those moments, again, the, the, the hair on my arm stood up and what a beautiful place to put a song like this, because this is X pouring his heart out for all to hear. Yeah, I mean, to me, this stands up there with Slippin' and, you know, X's most powerful songs in his entire catalog. Yeah. You know, um, I think that it is it delivers on the promise of what this album was supposed to be, which is showcasing uh, the maturity and evolution of DMX, you know, at 50 years old and who he's become. It's raw, it's honest, it's insightful. Um, you know, anybody who has, you know, uh, any father who has sons, especially sons who've grown up, it is a complicated relationship, especially with your oldest, you know. Um, and, you know, while it might not mirror this, there, there are definitely things that echo and resonate with anybody. Um, and I think it's a unique dynamic between fathers and sons, oldest sons. Mm. So to, to hear it is just like super powerful, you know? Um, and, you know, lines like, cause what if it's when I'm gone, you know? Uh, so apparently Swiss played this song for um, Xavier um, before the album came out, but I, I believe after X is passing. Yeah. Is when he heard it for the first time. So to hear that line, can you imagine hearing that line? Like, um, and then, you know, that you know he says that you got to realize you're wrong and we could have been best of friends all along but they said but that's probably the point of this song you know um but um it's just i don't know man prophetic and powerful and vulnerable and yeah. mournful all the things that make dmx who he is and the subtitle of the song is call your father um which you know hit me too like you know that just this song is heavy. There's other places in the album where DMX makes reference to his health, um, you know, declining, which I think in, in reference to where he says that he means as he gets older. Um, but there's a few spots in the album that are deeply prophetic. And, you know, we get that with Biggie, we get that with Tupac, where there's lines that they gave us that made a lot more sense in ways that they could not have known at the time. And, and this is heavy. It's a really, really beautiful tribute. And, um, you know, we talked about Alicia Keys and, and her role in that song, and I got to give it up to Usher. Um, it wasn't until I'd listened to the song three times that I even stopped to pay attention that that was Usher, but he uses his instrument, his voice to help set the tone on the record. And it's another place that's just super evocative. I consider it catharsis. I mean, um, this is just being let in in the most intimate way to a father and a son that have not had a perfect relationship, but that, you know, this record is a gift and probably says things in, in verse that were really hard to say in conversation. Yeah, I mean, he actually, you know, says a phone number. Do you think that was his real phone number in the lyrics? I, I kind of think that it was just knowing who he was. Yeah, it makes you wonder. And, and you know, historically that's happened in rap well beyond Mike Jones. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's truly just an honest record. And, and you wonder if the origins of this record were even that, like for private consumption. But in any way, I'm, I'm glad that it's, it's here. And it's, it's the last song on the album, which uh, is a bold move for any producer to end something on something, you know, on a, on a mood so heavy. But I think I, I applaud Swizz because I think that fits DMX. I think that fits this loss. And I think it fits where I get the sense from the interviews with Drink Champs and Talib Kweli, where his headspace was in 2021 before this tragedy. Did you call the number? No, <laughs> I did not. I'm going to call it right now. See what happens. Subscriber you have dialed is not in service. Can Damn. you feel you've received this message? In I bet that was his real number, man. Uh, mm. It wouldn't surprise me, you know. Um, I will say just, you know, to close it on not such a heavy note for this song, that Twist says that when he played it for Xavier, the reception was like very, very warm. Like apparently he was like, you know, jumping around the room and clapping and um, really received it the way that it was intended, which was, you know, it's, it's, it's in a lot of ways, it's a love letter. 
Mm-hmm. It's, it's, so um, it's a tough love letter. Um, I don't look yeah. at it as a sad song. I think that's just it. It's a love letter and it's a reminder. And and I don't, you know, I don't have children, but you know, I have a father that had a family after mine. You know that, and that's complicated. So to to hear something like this, yeah, it's just a, it's a powerful, powerful joint. And it's um, it's not my favorite song on the album in terms of listenability, but I think it's the the best gift on the album, and it's something that I feel like should be treated as such. Yeah. And last up is prayer. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 what the evocation. Um, it's just powerful to hear X. It's it's recorded. I don't know if it was, um, you know, one of the uh, the good, you know, music, uh, so, you know, Sundays, or if it was from one of his concerts. But X frequently, you know, in public places, broke into prayer and. And what he says is, is, you know, a testimony of his life on how to be judged and, and just being a man of faith and, and seeking salvation. Um, and again, you know, what a, what a powerful and appropriate place to end the record. Yeah, I don't know if it was recorded for Sunday service, but it was uh, what we first heard at the memorial service when they opened up. Um, yeah, I mean, DMX has done this. It's become a tradition on his albums, and so you know it made sense to to have it, and um, you got to close with that, you know, mm-hmm. another way. It, and those two those two lineups, the letter to my son and prayer, man, just powerful. Yeah, powerful. very different. But I think you know overall, it showcases uh, the many sides of DMX. This album, you know, um, um, and I think it's a really really fitting send off for him. Um, but thinking about his overall catalog, where would you put it in his, in his catalog? Yeah, this, this is a question I struggle with. Um, for me, I put it at number six. Um, so, and I, it's interesting, you know, X, the first three albums in order is how I go. If you catch me on the right day, I might say flesh of my flesh over, uh, it's dark and hell is hot. Um, then I go grand tramp, great depression, this, and to me, year of the dog again, um is is what i consider next i'm not gonna get into the other stuff that x put out but that's me um and i i look at it yeah just like you said as a send-off what about you you know as of now i put it at number three man um there are seven songs on it that i really like musically and or lyrically out of ten so that that's pretty that's pretty strong concentration um you know so i put it behind it's dark and hell is hot and flesh my flesh um um, and then I would put Exodus, and then I think the rest of it, I, I agree with you. And then there was X, Grand Champ, Great Depression, and then Year of the Dog. So again, so that's a, that, that's my lineup. That's yeah, my lineup. and I think when we did this before with The Plugs I Met Too by Benny, we did it recently with, with J. Cole, um, you typically on the new album, I, I think I'm a little bit more trepidatious, you know, like, I hold them down a bit and I think you um, see them a little bit more powerfully. And I don't know if that's a reflection of you and, and I um, specifically, but yeah, that's, that's how I look at this album. Um, overall, I think it, again, the word I keep using is, is send off. So one of the interesting questions then that this, this brings me to is about comeback albums. So this is X's first album since 2012 it's indisputable that it's a comeback album. Um, You know, I wonder if it is the greatest comeback album of all time. And let me set up what I mean by comeback album first, right? So I really wanna stress greatest and comeback because there are two in my mind kind of like factors that you gotta consider in making the decision. One is the quality of the album it's got to be great. There's a lot of people who make comeback albums and, you know, uh, and, you know, not that great. But two is comeback. And for me, it's like the, the level of the comeback, the journey that they had to get there, the amount of time, um, the amount of albums, life circumstances, all that stuff that, that like really kind of, um, you know, dictates what the comeback is. I think the two of those things the greater the, the, the circumstances you have to overcome, um, um, you know, the less important the music is, 
but if but the music is, is banging of course you know but the greater the music is the less important the hurdles you had to jump over and stuff like that uh and the comeback are ideally you want to have like peak 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 of both for the greatest comeback album you know um so with that in mind um i want to have a discussion about great comeback albums first of all and then where this fits in that Okay. So some of the ones that I named um, were the Carter, because Lil Wayne, you know, he had his first kind of era with, was really very much cash money, you know, where it's BG and, you know. Um, hot boys. Yeah. Hot boys, all that stuff. Um, and that was a very, and Manny first, very distinct sound. The Carter was Wayne as a solo artist and, a, and more importantly, a, a man instead of like, a, you know, um, a young man or, or like um, maturing um, uh, young man when he first did his, um, his early, so because he was just a teenager, you know. Another one is Recovery um, by Eminem, you know, who had gone through a couple of albums that were not well received after being, you know, the biggest artist on the planet and gone through a really serious like um, drug addiction and kicked that. And, you know, this was very personal, also had great songs, Not Afraid was on that album, you know, and, and a couple other joints. I uh, put 444 in there because I don't know that Jay had an album that was well received since the Black album. You know, Kingdom Come was obviously very polarizing. Uh, Blueprint 3 was polarizing for people. Magna Carta, Holy Grail was even more polarizing. 444 was the first one where people were like, yo, Jay is back and this is probably another classic. So that's like a, you know, I don't know, like 12 year period or something like that. And listen, like Jay-Z didn't overcome hardships in life because he in that time became a billionaire, but he certainly overcame like a very, very serious musical drought or what a lot of people consider to be a musical drought. And he was finding his voice uh, as an artist, and you're gonna say that uh, you'd put American Gangster in there, um, at, in between Kingdom Come and like uh, Magna Carta, Holy Grail. Yeah. I say it's a little different only because Jay himself said that what it gave him license to do is to rap like Reasonable Doubt, rap about that drug, you know, um, life, and it, because he was still trying to find his voice, how to articulate who he was as an artist without that. But this gave him the pretext to do that. So I agree with you on that great. point. Yeah. Uh, I would put King's Disease up there because um, Nas, um, I think, had a drop between Life is Good and that. Nazir, you know, nobody's really checking for Lost Tapes 2, uh, was more kind of like, you know, cutting on the floor stuff. Um, King's Disease, you and I kind of split on, you know, how good that album was. I think I, I like it more than you did, but, you know, it just won Best Rap Album. So clearly it was something, you know. I think Rap Music by Killer Mike. Now that one is um, debatable because, um, you know, Mike had never really been a, a firmly established solo artist before. He was kind of like just Dungeon Family and Outkast guy and stuff like that. And so it's arguable that Rap Music is the one that put him on the map. Starts the uh, J curve. Yeah. yeah, it starts to run, yeah, run the, like that whole run, but like, I mean, but he, I don't think many people anticipated hearing from Killer Mike after his solo album before rap music, you know, uh, and, and definitely not at the level where he is now. Um, a few more for me were 2001 by Dr. Dre, um, you know, the, uh, the compilation, I'm forgetting even what it's called now, um, but when he first launched Aftermath. Um, oh, yeah, it's just called that, the Aftermath. Aftermath yeah. Um, nobody's really checking for that, been there, done that, um, you know, and so that was like a seven year period stretch between that. And obviously he went through like all the drama with death row, losing all the masters, basically losing his shirt. Like he gave, got rid of everything and overcame all of that to come back with 2001 and have a whole new era with Eminem and 50 and, and, you know, Kendrick and, and, you know, all the aftermath stuff. Um, B by Common. Uh, that one's a much smaller gap. You know, Electric Circus is probably the only one that he had that was questionable in between that. Mama said, knock you out, which, you know, LL so don't call it a comeback, but it was a comeback. But, you know, if you think about it, back in the day, it seemed like a long time that he had kind of like gone away uh, with, um, 
the album Walk Like a Panther. Yeah, and 14 really, shots. But it was, oh, really, that was, it was only three years though. You know yeah. what I mean? Right? So it wasn't it wasn't that long. Um, only built for Cuban Links Part Two. Ray had released a lot of material, but none that was re received as as well as that was between, and that was several years. Um, um, and then Buster Rhymes ELE Two, which was I think a twelve year gap, and Buster overcame twelve years, pieced it together very much like Exodus over multiple years, lost his manager and close friend Chris Lighty, had very serious life threatening health issues, you know, gained a ton of weight. Um, battled depression, had a bunch of stuff, and released what I believe to be the best album of his career, and uh, a true a true classic, and probably the best album you know of the twelve year period of Grammy eligibility still. Mm. So um, those twelve are months, ones. yeah, those are my ones. What what are, what are yours? I agree with all of yours, with the exception of King's Disease. Um, I just don't know that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I can I can see that. I 100% think that Life is Good was a comeback. I think that up until that point, you know, Distant Relatives and the Untitled album, <clears throat> Nas had done things that were very lofty and albums that I really liked, but I feel like Nas has had a very polarized audience, but I've never heard anyone decry Life is Good. I thought that was one. Um, oh, yeah, no, I'm saying between Life is Good and that. Yeah, Life is Good is, is like uh, is one of my favorite of all time. Right, no, 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 but yeah. I'm saying I think that's a comeback album. Um, oh, you think, well, and maybe he's got two then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and you could argue that with other people too. Um, you know, some of the some of the bigger ones that might not jump out are My Ghetto Report Card by E40. Um, I, I feel like you know, 40, it's different than what you said about Killer Mike. Um, you know, 40 had been making noise in the early 90s, the click and all of that, but he had his moment in the sun with that album and to watch an artist from Vallejo get nationwide attention by creating something new and different you know working with little john and rick rock and t-pain i just thought that was interesting um sean price with monkey bars i mean that that in an underground matters to me i mean helter skelter came out they charted they had they were kind of like the last you know iteration of the boot camp click um and and did really well and then sean made this, this album that was kind of his his farewell in a way of like if this doesn't work I'm going to go get a straight job or, or hustle or whatever. And that album, as we know, created a pathway for the next 10 years for his life and his career. Similarly, you know, two chains with based on a true story, um, little different, but like the player circle had run their course and two chains ran, you know, not reinvented himself, but did the unthinkable, which went from an artist that seemed like a one hit or two hit wonder and became one of the most commanding artists of the early 2010s into today. Um, two other cases I'll make are T.I. is King. And that one is a little bit closer, I think, to Killer Mike. I mean, T.I. had hits, um, you know, in the mid 2000s. He came up with Arista and kind of had bounced around. And then King just asserted himself in the A-list class of rap. And I think a lot of folks may have thought that T.I. had peaked with one or two singles on an album um that's a little bit different when you talk about comeback but i think it's worth mentioning and on a far more clear example i would say snoop dogg's blue carpet treatment um you know sort of like raekwon possibly like nas i think snoop has lived in the shadow of his his debut since it dropped and while he had hits on you know rhythm and gangster and you know different albums that album to me um was Snoop's finest work besides Doggy Style. And for him to do it 13 years after that, I thought was a true comeback. And I don't, I don't know that that was his best-selling album or produced the biggest hits, but from a fan's perspective and a hip hop head's perspective, to me, that was a true, true comeback. Um, but yeah, I mean, between you and I, we've covered a lot of the rap map. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that being said, is Exodus hip hop's greatest comeback album? No. All right. So if you say no, where what do you put? A, what what is hip hop's greatest comeback album? You know, I, I like our list. From that list, um, wait. But first, why do you say no? Why do you say no? To me, this is a send off, not a comeback. I I, I like your point. I mean, X is coming back from a lot. 
I like this album. I think, you know, we've given great merit to this album, but I don't think musically as a body of work, X is coming back from a lot, but I don't think this album, you know, competes with his, and this is me. I don't think it competes with his, his, his best work. You put it as his third, you know, right now today, his third best album. I have it at, um, what did I say? Number six. Yeah. yeah. So I don't see it as that contender. I think it's a, I think it's a send off. I think it's a, a, a fitting um, tribute to many different sides of the man and the artist. But even if it comes in at number one, I don't put it at that. To me, um, of that list, I would personally say Dr. Dre's 2001 is hip hop's greatest comeback album. All right. Um, I'm going to agree that it's not hip hop's greatest comeback album, but I think it's close. I think that um, one, like I said, seven out of the 10 songs I like a lot. And uh, that's just on four or five listens over um, less than 24 hour period. I think it's going to grow on me. And I think that it does stand very, very high in Exus catalog. And then when you couple it with everything that he went through, you know, the jail time, the like constant struggle with substance abuse, um, just the, the mental anguish that he seemed to be in so much of the time and the, and the yo-yoing too. Like, I mean, he, he had periods of like, when we saw him at the Roots picnic, he looked great, you know, and during the Rough Riders reunion tour, he had so many like, you know, flirtations with seeming to be back on top or, or getting back to that only to crash again, you know, to go to jail in 2019 and things like that. And so to continue to battle and continue to fight and get to that place where he could put out a, a product like this, I think the circumstance part is massive. And there's only, there are only two people who I think can rival that level of like um, struggle against life circumstance. And um, I, and it's those two people that I, I would put ahead of X just because I think the bodies of work are stronger. And I agree with you on, on Dre with 2001. The other for me is Busta with Word. Extinction Level Event 2. I, I just think it's just a masterpiece. And for him to do that after everything, including like, especially like the, the Chris Lighty death, which was really, really big for him, you know, uh, I think those things put those two albums above, but you know, you know, all the other ones that I looked through, the circumstances that they overcame just aren't the same. You know, they overcame like a couple of bad albums. Right. You know? um, uh, some of them getting very rich in the process. You know, um, and for, you know, LL even like uh, was starting to become like a movie star and stuff like that. So common. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, the life circumstance. You know kind of discounts a lot of them for me. Um, but when you couple life circumstance with, with bodies of work, 2001 and extension level event too, I, I can't come up with anything better than that. Yeah, I knew you were going to say Busta. I mean, to me, and and I've seen a lot of pushback on Twitter over, um, you know, just the last, you know, however many hours, not even 24 yet. And I think that it's one of those things that's frustrating to to me as a wait push back a, on what on on exodus you know um and what so people saying they don't like it or what yeah people saying that they don't feel it's a quality album and to me there's quality here and yes. to me you know you can you can have that first listen not be satisfied and immediately putting put something out into the universe on why you weren't satisfied but when you really sit with it and, and, and look through it. And you and I, for the last, you know, X amount, you know, over an hour, we've been very honest. And there's moments on here that you and I both do not feel, but I think there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stones in the sand, so to speak. Yeah. And to me, I look at this album as somebody, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. I don't even know. I think X's circumstances um, eclipse Busta's. And, and I know, you know, just in terms of that, you know, of, of what he faced and what he has, you know, fought against. But I think it takes that man's life, that man's legacy and puts it in a place of dignity 
grace and gives you moments um, of, of, you know, captivating moments on the personal side as well as the musical side. And I feel as though that, you know, deserves celebration. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm curious to, to hear how we think about the album maybe six months from now. I wanna mm -hmm. do that. I think we should actually have an episode um, where we dedicated to going back and listening to albums that we've really broken down. And um, you know, three months later, six months later, and and unpacking how we feel about them. You know, and right now I would include Busta in that, J. Cole, and DMX. So let, let's both remember to do that. I think I think we should do that just to see, just to put our own like words to the test to see mm. things open up for us. Um, but yeah, I I I think this definitely um, is a good send off. I don't think it does anything remotely to damage his legacy. No. And I think it, I personally believe it burnishes his legacy to some degree, you know. Um, do you do you feel that this is the kind of album? I mean, you know, one of the things I didn't say in my list is, you know, A Tribe Called Quest with their 2016 album, you know, Thank You For Your Service, We've Got It From Here, um, or I, I flipped the title. And I remember there being some disappointment, none more than Q-Tip, when that album wasn't, you know, nominated for a Grammy. You know, given the cloud of X, what his loss means to music, given the power of, of Def Jam and the polish and presentation of this album right now, today, regardless of what you think or I think, you know, subjectively, do you do you see this being a Grammy nominated uh, album for, for best rap album in 2022? Today, I think it is absolutely nominated and probably the front runner. I think it's probably the front runner. I think, you know, just given what we saw with Kings of These, which we both kind of think was a, a career accolade more so than for that specific album. Um, I think given what DMX meant to the culture, um, him never being recognized in that way by uh, the Grammys and his passing and the strength of this album, you know, yeah. I think it's, it's um, good enough to be recognized for sure. Um, that 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 would, that that would push him over. Plus, we know how political the Grammys are too. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I think it would probably be the front runner and definitely nominated. Yeah, when people go for name brand recognition. I think, I think it would be nominated. I'm curious, and it's an interesting time, you know, for Busta and for J Cole. You know, two guys who are are competing for their first of their own on an album level, and. Uh, yeah, that uh, that's it's just an interesting storyline, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, moving on to a couple quick things before we close, um, I, I want to touch on, and we, we've written about this on the site, so people can definitely go and check it out extensively on embroidersforheads.com. You've written some really amazing tributes to folks, um, but we lost over the last two weeks, uh, Paul Mooney. And, uh, you know, who is a phenomenal comedic mind. Uh, a lot of people might not know him, his name directly, or I, I think most people, you know, who rock with us probably do, but for those who don't, was a uh, key writer for Richard Pryor, a key writer for Chappelle's show, appeared on Ch Chappelle's show quite a bit. I think he was also um, involved in the Boondocks. Living Color. And Living Color, just a, a real um, comedic genius. He died, um, I think it was like 76. Something like that, so something 78, like that. something, yeah. And then Chi Modu, who was a phenomenal hip hop photographer, um, did a lot of stuff for the source, uh, photographed the infamous cover with Mob Deep, um, classic uh, pictures of Biggie and uh, Tupac and Nas, you know, just like all the hip hop giants, this guy chronicled with his camera. Uh, so that was a gigantic loss. And you want to talk about Captain Rock? Yeah, I mean, Captain Rock was, a, you know, an 80s artist, um, you know, one of those electro rap, you know, folks whose influence transcends. And, and I just anytime we lose somebody, I feel that hip hop is a is a, you know, a fraternity of sorts. And it's just important to mention. And yeah, I mean, you know, Paul and, and Chi and Captain Rock, I mean, just RIP this year has been um, crazy. And obviously, we, you know, ex Black Rob. Prince Marky D on and on and on. Um, just a wild time. Yeah. So the only other thing I wanted to touch on, and, and you feel free to like you know, bring up other stuff you want, um, but the, the, the thing that was really important to me to acknowledge is that the NBA playoffs are back. 
and they are back in person, which is phenomenal. You know, teams are traveling, they're playing in front of audiences. Um, in some cases, like in Madison Square Garden, I think it was like 100% capacity, it was insane. And they're doing crazy stuff like on one side, if you're vaccinated, you, could, you don't have to wear a mask. The other side, um, you, you do if you're not. Um, I, I'm not sure this, about the science of that, but you know, neither here yeah. nor there. But it's great to see the NBA back in its glory and returning to normalcy and great teams, great superstars. Um, but a, a thing that has happened at a disturbing level is fan, um, and I, I don't, I, I don't even want to call these people fans attendees doing incredibly disrespectful, disgusting things to players. So just on the same night, three inc incidents happened. Um, one, during the Wizards game, as Russell Westbrook was walking back into the locker room, a fan dumped popcorn on his head. And he had to be restrained, you know, uh, from going going and like, you know, having words and probably more than that with, with, with the, the person. The second is that um, at the Utah Jazz game where John Morant's parents and family were, uh, what, went, what started off as friendly kind of like jaw jacking between them and, and some uh, Utah um, fans turned into some people, you know, um, you, know call, you know, hurling racial epithets at them and calling his mom out of name and like really disgusting, despicable things. I think two or three people were ejected from that event. The third is that Trey Young, while taking the ball out of bounds in New York at Madison Square Garden, a fan who's in the second row, um, notably just behind 50 Cent, spits over 50 Cent onto Trey Young's arm as he's inbounding the ball. Now, this behavior, you know, we, we've seen what happens when um, it goes bad, you know, with uh, the Indiana Pacers, um, Detroit no. Pistons game. Yeah. where they went in and got active on people and were knocking people out, you know? I'm reading this book called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson now, and it's talking about how America is actually one of the most rigid and um, defined caste systems in the world. And maybe it's got me riled up, but I gotta believe that um, there is not enough coverage about what's the subtext here. So it's one thing to look at an athlete and not recognize the humanity of someone who is famous and a celebrity and that you read about and you only think about and you don't really, it doesn't connect with you that they're a human being even when you see them in person. But I don't see this happening to Luka Doncic, um, to you know, Christoph Porzingis, to um, Jokic. Like, I don't see this happening to white stars. I see this exclusively happening to black NBA players. And I do think that there is a direct correlation in people not viewing black people as human, as seeing them as less than something sub. And I think that that needs to be pulled out explicitly. You know, and the second thing is there are bands of these people that get pulled out of the arena, they get banned. But Stephen A. Smith said something that I agree with wholeheartedly banning is not enough. These people need to be outed publicly. Their pictures need to be shown. Their names need to be printed. They need to be treated just like anybody who's doing a mass shooting, how the players would be treated if they were to, to reverse that behavior. Anybody who's treating any, doing any kind of criminal activity, and that's the third thing, is that what people are doing is actual criminal activity. Maybe not the name calling, but if you spit on someone or you dump popcorn on someone, that is assault. That is prosecutable and they absolutely should be prosecuted. Um, so you know, that's the thing that's been on my mind. Um, you know, I don't know how many people are gonna see it or whatever, but I think it's important to start to change that. You know, I think that it may have been heightened given the four years we just had with one of the most polarizing presidents in our history. I think it's been heightened because people have been on lockdown and lost touch with humanity and we're all just more and more just screens to one another or avatars or profile names or whatever it may be, and, you know, Twitter fingers and all that stuff. I think it's also been exacerbated by um, the events of the last year following the murder of George Floyd. And, um, you know, I think that racial, t racial tensions are higher than they've ever been too. But until we start to talk about it and identify what it is, I don't think that it's gonna be addressed to the extent that it should be. But, you know, that's, that's, that's my uh, end of my, my rant.
Man, I agree with everything that you said. And I say this as a white man, I think that there's a lot of white folks out here that just don't know how to talk to other people. And when I say other people, I mean other white folks, I mean folks of color, all of that. And, uh, and I think that sports and entertainment are places where people are communicating with, with folks that they don't know how to, and that comes across terribly. And I think that social media plays another role in it because if you've had a bunch of drinks and you're at a game and you know you're going to be famous for doing this heinous thing and um you know i you said mass shooters i you know the, there was that incident with the cubs steve was it steve bartman or you know the the guy who messed with the foul ball that cost the cubs you know that series you know 10 20 years ago and his name was everywhere like he couldn't show face there's a whole 30 for 30 on that guy not being able to turn up in Chicago. And I think there needs to be consequences and repercussions to folks that do that. Um, so I feel you and, and I respect everything that you, you just said there. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And there's the Karen thing too, right? That, that became a, 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 a name uh, that you don't want to be called based on the fact that the woman who, you know, tried to get that guy arrested or worse um, who was bird watching was named Karen. So I think that that would be a major deterrent to folks, but, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and this, this started a while ago with, you know, LeBron and, and that woman, what was it last year with the playoffs, you know, on the sidelines where she had something to say and he turned around and, yeah. you know, it's an ongoing thing real quick. My favorite, one of my favorite stories, and I pitched this to ESPN, the magazine, they never got back to me is uh, Tony Phillips, you know, who was uh, played for the Detroit, Detroit Tigers, Chicago White Sox. He was in the field one time and guys were heckling him and apparently saying, you know, racial epithets. Later in the game, Tony Phillips was a hot-headed guy, gets ejected. It was early in the game, goes outside the stadium, buys a ticket in his, you know, suit and tie, you know, street clothes that athletes wear, goes up in the crowd and uh, gave that section some comeuppance. <laughs> and uh yeah. you yeah. know yeah. but that's 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 we the, the, the shit has to stop because it makes us all look bad word word so anything else uh, any other quick hits you want to cover just a quick hit i thought that was kind of dope alchemist you know coming off of a grammy nominated run with freddie gibbs and continues to be probably right up there with griselda uh which is you know partly home team for him um you know super prolific he said that he put an album on youtube under another name and it's there for folks to discover. And I just thought, you know, at a time when uploading and being inundated with music can seem like a struggle, it's pretty cool that one of the best producers of our time put an album out there. Like that term Easter egg, you know, refers to video games and movies and stuff. But I just love that. It's a fun idea. And when they find it, I'll be eager to listen. Yeah, no, that's ill. So we don't know the name of it. Don't know the name of it. Presumably, you know, it could be just instrumental, could be, you know, Al, Al works with so many people, but he just dropped that like, uh, you know, last week and uh, we retreated it right away. And then Complex did a cool story. I just I love that at a time for all the reasons you just mentioned, when the world can be tense and, you know, we've suffered so many losses in 2021 that people are still making the art of digging, which is, is so virtual now, you know, fun and exciting like that. Yeah, Alchemist is ill, man. You know he's one of my favorite producers and definitely the last couple of years. Uh, so speaking of which, some new music dropped. Um, Makami has an album. Um, is gr second Griselda, is it second Griselda album or, or first? I, and, and I could be wrong on this. I, I believe it's his first, but it marks a reunion. You know, he kind of had a relationship with, you know, West Side Gun and, and some of those guys a while ago. And then it went on Bad Blood for a while, him and the God Fahim. And to see that come full circle, you know, you and I have talked about this before, but what a great example it sets that, you know, even if they may have been chippy for a little bit to watch, you know, two artists or two movements that are very respected in, in the underground and helping kind of revive an aesthetic in hip hop. Shout out to Justin Hunt, calls it connoisseur rap. And he coined that, um, you know, to see them working together when, uh, you know, arguably they don't have to. And I would I would venture to say, you know, on a solo level, this is uh, one of the probably the best Mac Hami project that I personally have heard. And I know there's some I've missed. So, yeah, I mean, I really, really enjoy this album. It's called Pray for Haiti. West Side Gun is featured on it a few times um, to Justin's point about connoisseur rap. I think he also made the point that a lot of these rhyme styles stem from Rock Marciano. And I think that applies to El Sweatshirt, to um, 
to uh, Boulder James, to Makami, to a, a lot of artists who fit that kind of aesthetic. And I think it's dope, man. Well, I added a couple of songs to the playlist, but definitely recommend people giving that a listen. Um, as I mentioned, I referred to earlier, Eminem released a, a new song, a remix to his song Killer uh, from his uh, album, uh, Music to like uh, Drive or to- um, Music to be murdered by. To be murdered by, right. Um, and uh, it's a, I think it's a standout performance from his guests, which is um, Jack Harlow and then also Corday. Um, so it's real cool to see him giving that love to up and coming MCs. I think he always wants to test himself against the new kind of like hot dudes who like can, can spit. And uh, I think Jack especially kind of pressed him on this one. His verse wasn't as long and as complicated, but his flow was super dope. And I think he went at him even though, uh, even while still acknowledging that he used to want to be like Shady. So that one was dope. But what, what else stood out to you? Yeah, I, I, I like that. Jack Harlow continues to impress. I love his joint with Static Selector from last year time, which is on our playlist. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you kind of sort rap, shout out to Ransom, um, you know, been doing it for a while. And I know there was folks out there that wanted us to include him in our best albums of 2020. He put several out. Him and Royce put a joint out called Greed. Um, I love the fact that, you know, even though Ransom has, you know, historic ties to Joe Budden and stuff like that for Royce, at a time when he's coming off of a Grammy run to work with an artist like Ransom. Um, dope, just a dense track. And then also, you know, shout out to uh, Peter Rosenberg. Uh, you know, Willie the Kid is another artist who I feel like has been doing this for a while. And he got on a joint that Peter, you know, is releasing or has released with Method Man and Raekwon called Next Chamber. Um, it's produced by Grey Matter. Uh, it has a very DJ premiere-esque sound. But I looked on Instagram this morning and Premier was uh, playing the joint on his radio show. So he's got the co-sign. And I like that, too. I mean, Willie the Kid, um, people may not realize, I believe he's Law the Dark Man's brother. Um, Law, I mean, 15 going on 20 years ago was showing me Willie the Kid's work, you know, when he was on Artist on the Come Up. And when I was at All Hip Hop, we covered him at a very early point in his career. So to watch him run with meth and ray really cool and then the other um thing i'll acknowledge is shout out to knowledge the pirate who has been a close associate of rock marciano and he put out an album this week called hidden treasures which if you're into mac homie you're into griselda you're into rock um i've really i was playing that album when we uh, started this podcast today and it's got stove god cooks on there it's got rome rome streets as well as uh, rock marcy himself so a lot of good music out there. I think that uh, as we move into summer, it's only going to heat up. Word. That's dope. Yo, well, always a pleasure, man. Um, that being said, what is your song of the week? Hood Blues, man. Shout out to X and, and Griselda. What about you? Word. Uh, I'm going to go with um, Letter to My Son. Powerful. You know, I, that one just like really struck me. Um you know, just it just on so many levels. So yeah, and I, I would I wouldn't have said that you know when I woke up this morning. But yeah, for Thanks. sure, letter to my son. So, alrighty, man. Well, shout out to DMX, rest in peace. Uh, shout out to Swiss Beats, and, and until we do it again, work. No, uh, enjoy enjoy yourself, man. Later. Likewise, man. See. You.